Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly jolt of libertarianism, brought to you by the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, our spiritual leader, and uh, <laughs> Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, <laughs> everyone. Howdy. Hi, Matt. Happy Monday, and I just want to say I don't really believe in spiritualism or leadership. It's fair. Okay. Mm. Uh, we're going <laughs> to... Did it die with to, Ecto uh, Cooler tea. High C, Peter? That's when you realize it was all a scam. Man, I had a Midori Sour cocktail that was called like an Ecto Cooler Sour or something mm. the other day. Great cocktail bar in D.C. Just wonderful. So green. Good stuff. Uh, as Prince sang, <laughs> your body's Ecto slamming. Uh, we're going to get mm. uh, to the uh, the deep waters of SCOTUS here in a moment but first a word from our sponsors students for liberty the most important ideas are those debated on college campuses think about how many different fringe concepts initially spawned in the academy that are now prevalent across society fa hayek noticed this phenomenon the ideas developed in academia soon spread to the rest of society that's why students for liberty support students like me in spreading the ideas of liberty on campuses as a coordinator with SFL, I've hosted high-profile speakers to discuss the pressing issues of the day, published magazines and articles to spread pro-liberty ideas, and helped organize and attend conferences on campuses around the world. SFL connected me with partner organizations, and thanks to SFL, I've been accepted to internships at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, National Review, the Cato Institute, and will start as an assistant editor at Reason Magazine this summer. My name is Jack McCastro, and I'm one of the thousands of volunteers from the SFL network building a freer future for people across the globe. Visit spreadliberty.org to discover how you can contribute to building a freer future at school and beyond. Okay, we're getting into the final days of the Supreme Court's 2023 to 2024 session. I can't wait, by the way, until we're like in a different decade because it's really hard to say those numbers all the time. It's just like it gets confusing. Uh, anyways, this means that we're going to see and have been seeing a bunch of controversial decisions of significance, unsubtle attempts to work the refs, and of course, some super awful journalistic commentary thereof, hopefully not including on this podcast, uh, last week's files included a unanimous rejection of standing in a case filed by opponents of the abortion pill Mifepristone. I, I prefer the Italian Mifepristone, Nick. Uh, and a more partisanly divided uh, 6-3 reversal of former president uh, Donald J. Trump's ban on bump stocks, which the majority ruled, amounted to the administrative state uh, making policy that Congress never Approved. All of this comes at a time of ongoing, quite one sided journalistic scrutiny of the court's conservative majority, including a sting operation secret audio tape of Justice Samuel Alito nodding along to some gal pretending to be an evangelical culture warrior of some sort or a uh, Catholic uh, conservative culture warrior. Catherine, let's start with the abortion pill ruling, uh, otherwise known as the Food and Drug Administration versus Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine. Uh, what does that do and not do? Why is it funny at all? And uh, perhaps uh, what does it or does not or uh, won't whatever uh, portend for the future? So this is a case uh, where uh, I don't always agree with Brett Kavanaugh, but he really nailed it when he said a desire to make a drug less available for others does not establish standing to sue. Basically, mind your business. <laughs> and uh, I think that this is an interesting case <laughs> because the Supreme Court uh, had been asked basically um, by plaintiffs who neither prescribe nor use a drug to reduce its availability and quite rightly said, no, thank you. Um, the fact that it took this long to get here, of course, is a sign that um, abortion politics obviously are um, super polarized. Everyone wants to be very careful. But uh, in this case, there is uh, a, a clear cut answer. Um, it does not mean that there can't be a challenge to the availability of this drug in the future, but actually establishing standing is really tricky. Uh, Kavanaugh also said um, just because somebody else doesn't have standing to sue does not give these plaintiffs standing to sue. So part of their argument was, well, maybe no one has standing to tell people what to do when they're not involved in that transaction. And the court was like, yeah, maybe like maybe no one. 
that's an idea. So in general, uh, a decision that I think uh, was well-founded and um, one of actually, I would say several, and we'll talk about this during the podcast, that are kind of common sense. Like it seems like the court is spending a little bit of time this week just explaining very basic stuff to people like you can't sue about something you're not involved in or in the bump stock ban. It's like, well, like is pushing pushing a trigger you have to push the trigger. Like there's a lot of that going on. Um, and maybe that's always the way of the Supreme Court. I don't know. But notable this week. Uh, Nick, the uh, Vanity Fair headline on the ruling was, quote, in surprise move, the Supreme Court decides not to obliterate abortion rights for now. Uh, do you think it's just a matter of time uh, before uh, the Supreme Court indeed obliterates abortion rights? And or uh, in a less uh, kind of extreme way, uh, what are you as a pro-choice feminist uh, worried about when it comes to Supreme Court jurisprudence on this issue? Uh, you know, I'm worried about the restriction of what I think is a fundamental right to uh, bodily autonomy. So uh, you, what's coming up in Louisiana is uh, will be a challenge to a law that was passed uh, that's going to seek to obliterate uh, access, uh, if not destroy completely access to these drugs. So, you know, we'll be seeing that. Um, so that's what I worry about, uh, whether it comes from the Supreme Court or someplace else. I hope at some point that we, uh, you know, start to think about uh, what happened when Roe versus Wade was overturned. Uh, and I know a lot of people turn to uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's you know, prophecy at the beginning of all of this that Roe v. Wade was a bad decision because it it, it was going to create all kinds of uh, political torment and ferment, et cetera, by uh, taking legislatures out of uh, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, kind of figuring out what what is legal and what isn't. Uh, in fact, what we're in for for a long time is just more and more of the same uh, state by state uh, politics of abortion stuff. And, you know, I what's interesting about the abortion pill rulings is that these things can also, you know, they cross state lines and there's a uh, federal uh, commerce clause issue here of whether or not people say living in Louisiana, women, birthing creatures, uh, whatever we're calling them right now, um, you know, do they have a right to get stuff in the mail uh, that a doctor who, you know, talked to them, uh, you know, thinks they should have or not. Um, so none of this is going away. I think in this particular instance, and also in the in the other ruling that we'll talk about briefly, uh, you know, it's good to see that the court is um, actually very principled uh, for the most part. I mean, they all have their ideological biases or their frameworks. But, you know, when it comes to basic issues of law and process, they seem to be lining up correctly, which is in favor of constitutional process, not, uh, you know, ham-fisted political stuff. It's really disappointing that they didn't rule that actually the Postal Service is illegal. It's a matter of time. Uh, I hope you mean the band, not the uh, the actual functioning of the post office. Uh, Peter, what is your sense of picking up on the politics of all of this? And as someone who lives in Washington, even though you're not currently there, as far as I know, uh, what is your sense of Democrats' uh, continued confidence rate that... Um, uh, making the defense of abortion access uh, is a successful uh, campaign issue. Oh, they're very confident. They view this as maybe their single best election issue going into the, the November elections. And you can just see that um, in all of the reports about how much money they're going to be pouring into ads, into the way that the Biden administration wants just to talk about this and wants to make this something that they are going to hit Trump with over and over and over again. So I think we're going to hear a lot about this before November. Uh, Catherine, uh, let's move on to bump stocks. The majority mm -hmm. in uh, Garland versus Cargill, um, not a country record, uh, held that the Bureau <laughs> of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms tried to pull a fast one by classifying yeah. bump stocks as machine guns, to which the explanatory journalism experts over at Vox uh, tweeted out, the Supreme <laughs> Court just effectively legalized machine guns. Uh, given your personal expertise in firearms, Catherine, why are Peter's friends at Vox uh, incorrect? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, why are Peter's friends in Kentucky psyched, which is another possible <laughs> yeah. framing for this why not both? question. Not or yeah. uh, um, and to be clear, my friends in Kentucky are psyched. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into the technical stuff, Catherine, yeah. do you push a trigger or pull a trigger? And I realize with a bump stock. I guess it's kind of you're going back and forth. Yeah, right? from now on. Well, this is a deadlift versus squat yeah. question, right? Yeah. Pushes versus pulls. Okay. 
I uh, henceforth will only be bumping my triggers thanks to the <laughs> Supreme Court. So, um, no, this is I, this is a like I say another case where the Supreme Court spent a really really long time. Uh, and some some kind of hay was made out of this, including some diagrams were in the in the the findings in the end. Um, just trying to establish like what exactly happens when you are holding um, a semi-automatic rifle with a bump stock on it, right? Like this this question is what most of this case turned on. And I have to say, I feel like emanating from some of the Supreme Court's uh, writings, this frustration of like, why is this our job? Maybe I'm just projecting. <laughs> but there's a there's like a lot of discussion that seems like something that can and should have been settled by so many other parties before it got to these nine idiots, right? So for instance, the ATF has repeatedly ruled on this question saying bump stocks do not, in fact, convert a semi-automatic rifle into a machine gun over and over and over. And then one last time, Trump said, are you sure? And they were like, oh, maybe it does. Um, so there's like a very clear paper trail there. Then, of course, this had to you know, work its way to the court again, uh, somehow without having fully clarified just the fundamental underlying mechanics. Um, I think I think, again, it's pretty straightforward. Like the way the law is written is very clear. You have to pull the trigger each time the gun fires. And that's it. That's what the law is written as. And, you know, as uh, you know, as the court noted, Congress could write the law a different way. Congress can feel free to write the law based on rate of fire. But that's not what they did. And it's not up to the court to fix that. I think this is great because it belatedly, and I hope Trump runs on this, remember he was coming in a power to get rid of the administrative state, and he kind of helped that along with Ooh. this ruling because oh, he's the one- This is fifth dimensional chess. Fifth dimensional <laughs> yeah. chess. I mean, we're, we don't know where it's going to land. He's still just moving his first night out from behind the, uh, the pawns. But uh, for me, that was fascinating beyond the fact that also it was a 6-3 decision, which is kind of interesting. Not all of the liberal judges were, you know, in lockstep on this. But mostly, you know, if we take the administrative state critique seriously, huzzah, you know, for the Supreme Court on this one. Huzzah, Matt Welch. Um, and I hope this comes back to bite Trump and his partisans on the ass in the way that all of the stuff that Joe Biden and, uh, you know, is doing with immigration or Obama did or George W. Bush. Let's have that discussion about what are the limits of the uh, executive branch and the administrative state. I, I really liked the bit uh, that Jacob Sellum wrote up in his great piece for Reason.com. He talked about how in February, the solicitor, the uh, attorney for the government defending the bump stock admitted that, you know, an expert, somebody who really knows how to fire a gun, could do the same thing with their finger. So if bump stops stocks are illegal, then I in somehow or another, that means that like hands and fingers, like human body parts, have been banned by the by the FDA or not by the FDA, by the <laughs> by the ATF. <laughs> Maybe also by the FDA. Yeah. Sort of. uh, but it, it yeah. also, I mean, the other part of it is that there's a logical issue with that, which is that if you can perform that action with your body and any semi-automatic gun, then in theory, any semi-automatic gun also counts as a machine gun under the same definition that was used to ban bump stocks. Would you say that this decision established the right to bear fingers, Peter? Ooh, uh, yes. Uh, you um, do what you want uh, with your fingers. Yeah. No. Uh, I fingers. actually really, really love something the, worse than dad jokes. The Mom desperate. Jokes. I'm I'm Mom trying to get jokes. in on the dad joke market. I feel like it's the, you know Father's Day yeah. has passed, so it's every man for himself now. Um, I, mean, I actually really loved the way that the the kind of partisan politics of this whole thing played out, right? Because of course Trump wants everyone to forget that it was you know the bump stock ban was actually uh, under his administration, but um, also. Folks on the left want the the whole thing to to somehow still be evidence that Trump is bad. And so you got this passage uh, in The New York Times. The decision prompted immediate blowback. Democrats seized on it, blaming former President Donald J. Trump and saying both his actions and his nominees on the court were decisive factors in the outcome. I wow. mean, that's true. Sorry, <laughs> that's a true paragraph. Both? But 
It's both sides of the issue were decisive he, factors. He, he I mean, this makes thing. about as much sense as the ATF's position that Correct. a bump stock makes a gun a machine gun, despite the fact that your finger can also make a gun a machine gun. Also, a rubber band can make a gun mm-hmm. a machine gun. Man, just ban it all. It's I mean, all that illegal. is, in fact, no you bands. have just said the quiet part loud. Like, that is, in fact, what most people on the left would like to do, so. Nick, did I hear you uh, drawing uh, drawing your pistol out of your holster there? No. Okay, right, please, uh, please Peter, um, just quickly to, to invert the question I asked you earlier about abortion rights uh, and the politics thereof, do you think Democrats are still of the, what I think is mistaken, belief that uh, being anti-gun is an effective national political issue? I think Democrats, especially under Joe Biden, are just extremely in thrall uh, to the to their interest groups. The Democratic Party right now, um, the official Democratic Party that, that exists in Washington, is just absolutely a, 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 a creature of, a product of, a bunch of niche, narrow, single issue, or, or in some cases, kind of mega single issue um uh, in terms of just bundling a whole bunch of stuff together and saying it's all the same thing, right? Like this is the, the bump stock ban uh, and, you know, support for freeing Palestine are all the same thing, right? And the, it, it, the, the Democratic Party right now does not have a good strategy for getting out of the grips of those groups and trying to figure out how to just talk to normal people who don't care about them. And you see that with guns, you see that with uh, with the economy, you see that with climate change and energy and just all sorts of issues here. And it's a real problem for them going into November. All right, let's get to the ongoing journalistic campaign against Justice Alito, uh, his wife's uh, flags, uh, Harlan Crow's apparently bottomless supply of uh, gifts and support for Clarence Thomas. <laughs> And so forth. Catherine, um, it may surprise you to learn that I am not conservative uh, and don't even play one on TV. And yet I uh, you're not calling yourself an economist conservative now, Matt. No, that we're in. No, I'm not a doctor, uh, Nick, Mm. Uh, but uh, it's it's been months uh, at least since. I have had any other reaction to whatever new story is that isn't just like, la, 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 I can't hear you. This is white noise. It's obviously partisan. Uh, Is that a mistake? Am I part of the problem? Is there a there there? You are absolutely part of the problem, but not for this, I would say. Um, There's, yeah, I've had that same reaction. Uh, I had actually a more specific reaction to the... um, the secret tape, the sting operation uh, news in which, uh, as you say, we had we had uh, stunning evidence that sometimes at cocktail parties, people politely agree with weirdos who walk up to them in an attempt to make the conversation <laughs> end sooner. And I've never felt that more like I felt that in my bones. Like this is if the, if you want to do a sting operation against me, just come up to me at a cocktail party and say some nonsense, and I will I will be like, that's an interesting perspective. Hey, for Catherine, sure. don't you think the state should exist? I yeah, I'll be like, mm, some people do think that. You know, it's so. Uh, I actually uh, I think many years ago, Matt, it was you who actually gave me the excellent advice Uh-oh. when I'm on TV not to um, nod. While other people are talking, because sometimes you're nodding in a kind of affable way. And then, boom, the host of the show says something bonkers. And then there's video of you seeming to agree. That's that was good advice. And maybe you should offer it I, I, to the Supreme Court. Almost certainly never gave that to you, but I'm happy. To uh, take yeah. That so I, I feel like the big bombshell of this week is um, people agree politely at cocktail parties. And I'm just not here to change my view about politics of the Supreme Court as a result. The the uh, trick is if you catch Nick Gillespie or me, but it's more funny with Nick as, as most things, uh, and walk up at a cocktail party and say, hey, Nick, do you remember my name? Sure. <laughs> you could have a name tag on and I would say, <laughs> no, I have no idea. Uh, well, no, he would say, yeah, slugger. <laughs> yeah, chief, babe. <laughs> uh, Nick, uh, I'm going to read you a quote from uh, America's leading centrist, Norm Ornstein, who's the emeritus a uh, scholar oh, wow. at the American Enterprise Institute and contributing He's the editor. guy who parachuted down by Joe Biden, right? <laughs> I think so. Uh, he's contributing editor for The Atlantic magazine. Well done, Jeffrey okay. Goldberg. We're watching you. Uh, I mean, contributing editor, though, you know. Uh, I, this is his uh, reaction to the um, the would-be James O'Keefing of, uh, of Sam Alito. 
utterly unethical, corrupt, a serial liar, and a radical lacking every element of judicial temperament, this monster does not... <laughs> Sorry, Norm. This monster does not belong in wow. civil society, much less on any court, much, much less on the Supreme Court. Um do we need to complete and total shutdown of Norm Ornstein until we can find out what's going on? Did he think that uh, Sam Alito was talking at the Young Thug trial or something in Atlanta? I don't oh know. I don't get that. God. Um, I do Just live stream Young Thug trial, everyone. It's very good. It's, it's fantastic. It, and it has so many great issues that uh, you know intersect with reason stuff, including old... Uh, we, we did videos about rappers getting thrown in jail based on their lyrics year, like a decade ago, so... Uh, but, uh, I actually, I don't think that Sam Alito was merely politely nodding. I think he wants a more godly society and fuck him on that score. But this I mean, he's is, a Catholic. He's a Catholic. Yeah, I know that, but you know, th this is that self-hatred. You know, won't, won't it's hate not self-hatred. It's emancipation. You know, he can, <laughs> he and Harrison Butker can go do each other's beards together somewhere, God. right? Um, but having said that, there's obviously nothing really here. And I think it was in the reason piece about this, and I'm forgetting who wrote it because Billy Billy I think it was I think it was Chief, a guy named Chief or Buddy who wrote it for Reason. <laughs> it was Emma Stone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nope. Nope. Uh, the lady, the lady uh wrote it for the reason. And um no, but uh John Roberts who played Patty in his high school production at an all boys school in You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, uh, which remains a thing that should go on his headstone, uh, you know, was caught in a similar situation. And he was like, yeah, you know, I worry about some of this kind of stuff, but it's, you know, none of this, none of this is serious. Well, and in fact, the, the Roberts gotcha was, uh, she said, um, uh, America is a Christian nation and our Supreme Court should be guiding us on this path. Yeah. And he was like, I don't really think we live in a Christian nation. I know a lot of Jews and Muslims who would say not. Yeah. And I think that's fine. Like, the, you know, he the, might be from a Drew. He's from Indian Indiana. So there's a good chance, like deep in the cornfield somewhere, they were doing like Druidic rites, pretending to be. Catholic, I hope but. so. God, do you understand the joy it would bring me if there is a giant expose that John Roberts <laughs> oh, yeah. is a secret Druid? Oh, God. Yeah. This no, is the America that I be, want. Yeah. No, but it, I, it's a I, very I want the good report quote. on, very on like his, his Spotify playlists, and one of them <laughs> yeah. is all black metal. <laughs> yes. This is the Wait, way. I wish that was that would true. Be. Uh, Peter, I've got uh, a conspiratorial sense oh. um, that you have to now answer. It's probably to. true. Uh, yes, it is true that Bob Woodward is the enforcer of the deep state. We've talked about this. But uh, the that. I don't know. It feels like all this like pro publica, like drip drip and all this stuff. It's like a run up to something like this is in preparation for something is uh, the uh, it, do you, is am I crazy? I mean, it just sort of like uh, like it, like an October surprise. Yeah. Mad Wolf? Not so, October surprise, but just like we're waiting on the Supreme Court to make some huge decision that we're going to say is utterly compromised by all the stuff we've been warning you about for the last two and a half years at ProPublica.org, which is a totally neutral, uh, just going to where the facts are organization. So let me take these questions individually. Are you yes. crazy? Yes. yes, absolutely. And that's not independent of the rest of the facts or context of that question. Number two, are they paving the way for something? I think the answer is maybe, but I'm not sure they know what that something is. And so I I, I want to pull us way back, like uh, almost 15 years to the time of the Tea Party, when there was that rant by what a Rick, Rick, whatever his Santelli. name on, yeah, yeah, on CNBC or something about how we need a new Tea Party. And 24 hours later, FreedomWorks and some of these other groups, uh, full disclosure, I worked at FreedomWorks for a year before all of this happened. Uh, some of these other groups like had websites up that were like new Tea Party. And that wasn't, you know, sort of the launch of the Tea Party movement as we knew it. None of those groups were planning for that Rick Santelli rants. They weren't planning for that exact moment, but they were just out there sort of like trying to plant the seeds of something that they hoped would eventually blossom into a thing that was kind of like the Tea Party. And they've been trying for years and most of their efforts didn't work. Um, I think that's probably the case here because that is how 
groups like this operate. And you know, there's just this sense on the left that the the Supreme Court um, in the last decade or so, but really since Trump, has become a kind of tool for illeg- illegitimate GOP power. And the best case for this is how the is the handling of the Merrick Garlic Merrick Garlic. The Barrick- <laughs> Merrick Garlic. Everyone's <laughs> Italian on the Supreme let's, Court. Let's, <laughs> let's get out of the 2020s and also remove the words Merrick Garland yeah. from the lexicon because it's all too hard to say. The the, the Merrick Garland nomination, right? Like, you, it wasn't illegal. It wasn't totally out of bounds, but it was um, quite unusual. It was a sort of classic McConnell uh, procedural tactical maneuver designed to produce a, an instant political victory and you know and sort of reshape the the power in in Washington. So that's the best case for it. But a lot of it is just the that they don't like that the Supreme Court is pretty consistent and pretty consistently has uh, has reined in the power of the executive branch in particular. You see that with the bump stock ban. And I think we're going to see it even more when the Chevron decision comes down later this month. All right. Well played. Uh, Let's uh, go to our listener email of the week in a moment, at least. But first, friends, I've got one word for you. Senolytics. That's right. Senolytics is a class of ingredients discovered over the past decade that could be a bombshell for promoting healthy aging. And enhancing your physical prime, here's how Senolytics work. As we age, everyone, even Nick Gillespie, accumulates senescent cells in their body. Senescent cells cause symptoms of aging, aches and discomfort, slow workout recovery, sluggish mental and physical energy. These zombie cells, just trying to get Peter's attention, are old and worn out, taking up space and nutrients from your healthy cells. But now you can prune these dead cells off your tree of life by taking Qualia Senolytic. Qualia Senolytic is a vegan, gluten-free, non-GMO, for those who celebrate, supplement, and you only need to take it twice a month to remove those zombie cells and halt the barbarians of aging at the cellular gates. So go to neurohacker.com slash roundtable right now and get a 100-day money-back guarantee up to $100 off. And when you use the code roundtable at checkout, which you obviously will, yet another 15% off the ticket price. That's neurohacker.com slash roundtable. Attack those zombie cells. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder to email. I I want that ad to be read in like the the two characters are in in a movie and they're listening to the radio and they hear that ad and they're like, "Ah, we don't need to worry about zombie cells. That seems silly. And then it's a zombie movie. This is the sequel to 28 Days Later that's going to come out. That's the thing you hear in the background and people decide to ignore it. I think Peter has finally snapped, Nick. I think we, we got we got him. Uh, Let's uh, reminder to everyone to email your queries uh, brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Jonathan Bowler, who writes, Dear Roundtable, I wanted to at least sort of push back on Joe Lancaster's article of June 12th about the vague noises some Republicans are making about bringing back the draft. While I obviously agree with the core premise that the draft was an abomination that needed to be torn down, there is something I think is way, in all caps, worse, way worse. The blank check this has written since 1972 for various presidents to bomb whoever they want, whenever they want, knowing that they would never face anywhere near the level of backlash for starting a new war as we saw during Vietnam. Am I crazy for thinking that abolishing the draft was probably the greatest gift we could have given the military industrial complex? I feel like knowing that this war or that war not only won't be your problem, but won't we won't won't be anyone you actually know and love's problem makes it way harder to get as angry as we should be about new pointless unending conflicts like Iraq or Afghanistan. Bringing the draft back is never going to happen, thankfully, and he puts a parenthetical question mark. Is there any way we can rebuild a similar alarm about a shitty war we have no business fighting like what went off during Vietnam? Catherine, maybe uh, you can answer that question against the backdrop of the House of Represent- the so-called House of Representatives on Friday passing into the National Defense Authorization Act a provision to make registration for the Selective Service automatically done by government for our 18 to 26-year-old males or 18-year-old males until their age 26, 
um, uh, as opposed uh, to having uh, to mail a card in. Listen, I do think it's true that having a volunteer army makes it easier for politicians to start wars. I think I do think that's true. But I, I do think there's like a two wrongs don't make a right situation here. So, you know, when you say is abolishing the draft the greatest gift we could have given to the military industrial complex, like maybe, but m- probably more importantly, it was the greatest gift we could have given to men age 18 to 26 who are now not going to go die in a war against their will. And I, that's that's like the more important gift. Um, so I think I think it's like you got to kind of keep perspective. Um, there are many, many ways that we could check uh, presidents or uh, the U.S. government generally in getting involved in wars that we shouldn't be involved in and uh, reinstituting the draft in order to put the fear of God and man into uh, the American populace is not the way. I don't actually think that this letter writer is proposing that per se, but that is the line of thinking that this that this uh, reasoning takes us down. And clearly, the uh, House of Representatives is quite open to it. Nick, uh, in addition to just answering the question, uh, maybe a point to, is this like a retelling of the history of Vietnam? Like, correct, do you think? Of the no, I don't think uh, so. And one, one of the things that um, this letter writer spurred me to do was to look a little bit at what was the effect? Who got drafted and who got killed in wars when it was a draft? Um, and World War II is a bizarre outlier in this. Thirty percent of men of draft age were drafted, so you know, phenomenally more people uh, were drafted. So you can't really draw many uh, comparisons from that. But if you look at Korea and Vietnam, and you look at uh, the first uh, Gulf Wars and things like that, and I looked for a couple articles about this. Uh, the fact is, is that the people who ended up actually serving and dying uh, were disproportionately lower income people with fewer opportunities so that the draft status did not do much to, you know, it, it the idea that a draft army, everybody serves. So like, you know, Richard Nixon's daughters are going to go to Vietnam. So like he wouldn't have that other, you know, it doesn't it doesn't actually work that way. It's also not clear that the number of deployments of soldiers in the all-volunteer era has increased. Uh, What has increased is that the length that soldiers serve or or armed forces serve during deployments has gone up, Uh, but that's mostly because we're participating in stupid wars. Um, So I think the, the, the issue of whether or not you have a volunteer or a draft army is almost completely separate from foreign policy policy decisions. And the one thing that we should definitely come back to, especially if Republicans who are, you know, starting to flirt with the idea of national, uh, you know, a draft or some kind of national service program or whatnot, is to understand that these are always and everywhere terrible uh, ideas, especially during peacetime. Uh, You know, that's one of the weirdest things is that we should have ended the draft after World War II and instead it stayed in place until 1973. That's a policy decision that was very bad and also probably allowed Vietnam to ramp up more quickly than it would have otherwise. Um, And then just, you know, we were talking about Congress at various points, not just in this episode, but through the entire existence of this. The, the real big issue here is that we need to get back to a place where Congress is actually involved in declaring wars rather than presidents. Uh, just uh, J.D. Vance, uh, who's a vice president, senator. Yeah. Uh, uh, and who served in the Canada. military. And who served. Um, he's uh, talked about having at least mandatory service uh, f- so that people have skin in the game, which is a similar notion. Donald yeah. Trump uh, has rejected the concept uh, outright, which... I think is good. Peter, how do you respond to the uh, the question? So just very literally, the greatest gift ever given to the military industrial complex was tens and tens of trillions of taxpayer dollars to build bombs and drones and guns and other stuff. So I don't think the draft is the greatest gift. Uh, I actually, I if you wanted to convince me that maybe we should have a draft, this is probably the route to do it because this is basically my position about taxes, which is that in fact, as long as the government is as big as it is, as long as it is spending as much as it is, uh, we should be taxing people more because the deficit spending that we have acts as a kind of subsidy on big government because people don't feel it directly. That is the argument that's built into this, and I think it's a reasonable one. It makes 
makes sense in a lot of ways. But like Nick said, there's not actually a whole lot of evidence that it works. Also, the draft. No, fuck that. Not having it. <laughs> this is uh, it's uh, Milton Friedman all the way down here, because you could argue that one reason people are less sensitive to how much the U.S. government spends is because of withholding. Right. We don't we mm -hmm. never see our money when we do pay our taxes. It just disappears from our paychecks. Milton Friedman, thank you for that, sir. Uh, but also probably the greatest thing he did, and I think the greatest thing he said he did was um, his work in abolishing the draft. So it's all really Milton Friedman. Uh, a couple of uh, points. <clears throat> One is that um, uh, since the abolition of the military draft, we have much, 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 much fewer casualties of war, uh, uh, American casualties of war. I've said this before. But the number of American servicemen and women who died in Vietnam in just the year 1968 exceeds the number who have died in all post-Vietnam wars combined. Um, and I think abolishing the draft is part of that. Um, and uh, that is a good uh, uh, part of that. I also associate myself completely with the comments from Ilya Soman. George Mason blogs a lot at Bullock uh, Conspiracy at the Reason.com site. Uh, we are not the property of the government, of a majority of the population, or of some employer. Mandatory national service is a frontal attack on that principle because it is a form of forced labor, literally so. Um, yeah, it's just that. Uh, once you say uh, it's a the the principle that the government has some right to your body is as fundamental as it gets. And it should be opposed with vehemence. The selective service should be thrown in the trash. Um, it was revived in a panic by Jimmy Carter in 1980 because he was frantically trying to look tough against the evil Soviet Union when it invaded Afghanistan, thereby leading to the cancellation of the 1980 Olympics or at least American participation in it in Moscow, which is just a catastrophic mistake, as Nick Gillespie well knows. Um, uh, no, we don't do uh, that. It's not an acceptable cost uh, ever to uh, put up individual Americans as cannon fodder for anybody's schemes um, uh, or in, including in those schemes of like, I will make you, I will sacrifice your body in the name of, I hope that that's going to motivate you to be, to agree with me that war is bad. No, you're going to have to use a better argument than that. Um, you're talking about depriving people's liberty. That is as fun to fucking mental as it gets. All right. Um, sorry for the, uh, for the cussing Fred Young. Um, let's go to uh, the next part of this podcast, which is uh, that even though it feels like a lifetime ago, Hunter Biden was convicted last week on three counts of doing the same thing. Actually, three counts that derived from doing the same thing, which is being a crackhead filling out a gun application. Um, this uh, now means that he faces a maximum of 25 years in prison, although the sentencing hasn't happened. It'll certainly be something uh, more than that. We've talked about this in the past, including last week, so we don't need to uh, linger over long. But let's uh, go on a little round of one big takeaway each, starting with Nick Gillespie. Uh, people's responses, and by people I mean the media's responses to fast-breaking news is almost completely soaked, or as you would say, uh, Matt, marinated in partisanship. Uh, the only way to predict how somebody is going to respond to a big uh, conviction or indictment or anything like that, it seems, or a Supreme Court ruling is almost always, if we're talking about the media, is what result they wanted and how they think this is either going to help or hurt their political agenda. So what is uh, an example of, or like a, a category of response that you are alluding to in this case, Nick? Uh, the, you know, more. people who talk about uh, the need for clemency for Hunter Biden or how this is not a meaningful prosecution, blah, blah, blah. If the situation is flipped and it's, I don't know, Neil Bush or, you know, Donald <laughs> Nixon or somebody, you know, uh, then they would be like, no, you know what? The law is the law and we're just following the law. Um, things like that. Neil Bush uh, reference uh, for the win, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Peter, uh, what, what's your one big takeaway from this? I like how you, he managed to get three convictions for what is essentially one action. It's like when you forget to take out the trash and your spouse gets mad at you, <laughs> not just the one time, but then like again, the next week and then like again, the, the month later, right? It's like, you just did it once. You should only be punished that now it's, just, uh, I think my takeaway is that if you are the son of a sitting president. I don't know, maybe don't write a book about how you were addicted to crack while you're also <laughs> owning, a, like buying a gun and reporting it lost to police. 
Yeah, the Hunter has just. It's a, it feels like a lifetime of uh, of uh, questionable decisions. Nick, I don't know where he uh, lists on your uh, stands on your list of unfortunate presidential offspring, but I gotta I gotta imagine he's top five at least. At this oh point. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, unfortunately, you know what's what's disappointing about the current election is we're not going to have a new cast of characters. That's the wild card of a new of a new person being president. You've always got that secret family tree, which yeah, we need is we need more wacky siblings and children. I mean, the other thing about this is maybe this is just what I was saying earlier about like the weariness of the courts. Like reading about this case, one is struck over and over by the spectacular number of unforced errors. Like just over and over and over. Everyone involved in this case was like, okay, let me write a memoir about my time as a crackhead just to really carefully document the timeline of my drug use against the timeline of my gun purchases. There's also the decision by uh, Hallie Biden to throw the gun in the trash, which then <laughs> in a grocery forces, store dumpster, in a grocery store dumpster, which then forces Hunter Biden's hand. He like they end up admitting to the existence of the gun because they are worried that they've like put it in bad hands. And it's just like move after move after move. Of, it depends on what grocery store dumpster, you know, it's like, oh, it's, this it's is different if it's if it's Costco versus if it's Winn-Dixie. What is the most responsible grocery store dumpster in which to dispose of your illegal firearms? Oh, a Whole be, Foods, definitely. You know, Gelson's. That's, Gelson's. A Meyer, maybe a. That's yeah. right. Um, uh, Erewhon, maybe? Oh, hmm. no. No way. Nobody mentally stable is paying that much for a smoothie. <laughs> Um, I just want to reiterate, though, like the, the Especially if Jacob, you have a gun, if you have a gun, you could just hold them up for the smoothie. And it sure. would still like the 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 time served would still be like less onerous than how much you have to pay. Um, 20 million Americans are committing the same felony that that Hunter Biden is in trouble for right now. If you buy survey data on drug use and gun ownership, uh, it is clearly selective prosecution, but the selection is partially political and partially just for like top tier idiocy. And I think it's hard to disaggregate those two. I was on CNN uh, this past week on a panel show uh, reacting, I think, on the day of it or closer to the day of it. And um, to Nick's point about like you can predict the response of people depending on what team they're playing for or uh, affiliate with. Uh, I just find it shocking uh, that when you say something uh, as, uh, uh, you know, banal, I think, uh, uh, like, uh, almost or tautological, that uh, both Donald Trump's conviction and Hunter Biden's conviction involved crimes in which there is no victim, and therefore maybe we should stop cheering about it. When you say that, people are like, wow, I never thought of that. <laughs> like, like literally had people like, I'm in surprise agreement with you, weirdo libertarian over there. I think it's like it. it is. Everyone is obvious. always surprised um, to be in agreement with a libertarian. Granted. And, you know, and certain of us more than others, I, I presume. But like, it's also like uh, per Catherine's uh, comment uh, about uh, the Supreme Court case. It's such like kind of common sense. Um, that I think people have been echo chambering themselves into this like weird magical uh, reality that doesn't make sense to people who are outside of the bubble. Like it, Max. it's kind of obvious. This stuff is politicized. Um, the people's reaction to it is uh, is politicized, and it is whenever the government decides that it it wants to prosecute you or whenever a prosecutor want, uh, decides that um there are all this just enormous stack of potential laws and uh and complicating and adding uh you know charges to the same thing 34 counts for a single act in Donald Trump's case um each one comes with its own uh, penalty um it's ridiculous like it, of course it's ridiculous what are you people even doing um and then when you mention that uh people are like huh Wow, that's interesting. Um, I think we need to have more "huh, that's interesting" moments, and that's uh, our our role here as uh, as otherwise powerless uh, libertarians is to point this out uh, repeatedly over the next uh, five six months as we get deep, deep, deep into the stupid of uh, national politics. Well, uh, and right, we stupid, should let's definitely do this because this is going to be the last election. So you know, and the most anything important you have to of say our about lifetime. election, right. say it before November. That's right. Catherine, you were saying something? It's the most important election of our lifetimes as well, mm. just to be clear. 
Thank you. Um, I was waiting to hear that. Uh, let's go to our end of podcast, what we have all been consuming in the cultural arena. Peter Suderman, why don't you lead us off? I watched Hitman, the new movie from Texas filmmaker Richard Linklater uh, on Netflix. It's a kind of true story about an undercover I wasn't actually a police officer, but uh, someone helping the police in Louisiana um, who uh, who started, he's a college professor, and he started helping the police do prosecutions of people who were trying to do murder for hire. He was just the tech guy. He was setting up the microphones and the cameras. And then he ended up as the person who was the undercover uh, agent who was posing as a hitman so that he could get the people to say, I want you to kill that guy for money. Um, and part of the part of what this movie really, really emphasizes is there is no such thing as a professional hitman. If you have contacted someone and and are offering them money to kill someone else for you because you need someone dead in your life and are willing to pay for it, that person is almost certainly scamming you or a police officer who is trying to entrap you. Uh, and it's true. It's like it's like uh, C.J. Sierra Mellon's piece uh, from a couple of years ago. You know, if you're like a fr- that starts with this idea of like if you're like a person with a little bit fringy politics, kind of a radical, and you meet some really helpful stranger who just appears super enthusiastic about all of your crazy, strange beliefs, and that person wants to help you do some terrorism, some like stuff with guns and bombs and maybe like a, a federal building as a target, that that person, probably a Fed. So same deal with hitmen. Like if you meet somebody who you want and, want, and you want that person to kill somebody and they're like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. You just pay me the $10,000. Probably, probably a cop. Anyway, the movie turns into a kind of cute romantic comedy after <laughs> yeah <laughs> sure. yeah after the Glenn Powell fake hitman character meets a young woman who wants her abusive bad husband killed and he in his hitman persona is like that's a bad idea you don't really want to do that take the money you were going to pay me go live your life and they meet again later and he he, the next time they meet, he is continuing to play his hitman persona, this other version of him. And she falls in love with the persona version, of course, not knowing that he's really just like a dorky, nebbishy college professor who like studies philosophy and psychology and like the idea of the self. Anyway, it's it's pretty cute. It's pretty charming. And it's on Netflix. You can watch it. It's better than a lot of the movies I've seen in the movie theater this year. Uh, putting the hit in Hitman or something like that. Um uh, Nick Gillespie, what did you uh, consume? I uh, watched the uh, movie version of the Venture Brothers. It's called Radiant is the Blood of the Baboon Heart. And it's the series finale uh, of the Venture Brothers series, which ran on Adult Swim from 2003 to 2018. And is a fantastic metatextual commentary on super science and uh, what I think a lot of boomers and Gen Xers in particular grew up with, a kind of romance of a future that was riffing off of JFK and Star Trek and Johnny Quest and all of that kind of stuff where we would have a lot of flying cars and we would mostly, the bad people in the world would be escaped Nazis with monocles and pet Komodo dragons <laughs> uh, driving inexplicably <laughs> World War I you know, biplanes or triplanes. Um, and uh, so this movie, which came out last year, is the series finale. Um, it has been canceled and it wraps everything up in this series, which is if if you're into comic books, if you're into things like Johnny Quest, uh, this is the ultimate series. And it is ultimately a meditation on the failure of a kind of 60s great society to deliver on the future that it promised. We have, and I'm forgetting when it's from, it's like 2003 or 2004, Dave Weigel then at Reason did a wonderful interview with the series creator uh, Jackson Public uh, for us, which goes deep on this. And uh, I highly recommend Radiant is the Blood of the Baboon Heart. If you love old shitty TV that you grew up with and um, how the future hasn't quite panned out the way that we were taught to believe that it would. That show ran on Adult Swim on the on the Cartoon Network initially, and I I just have this theory that a, Adult Swim is kind of the is is like the secret key to 
to culture for the last 25 years in some way that we haven't really grappled with. I mean, it's the Mad Magazine of its era, right? Like in some way, you can trace absolutely everything back to it. If you only experienced American culture by watching uh, Adult Swim, starting with Space Ghost Coast to Coast, which is just the most bonkers, delightful send up deconstruction of both cartoons and talk shows, you like you would kind of understand all of America from the late 1990s through now, even if that was all you had seen. Again, in the same way that like if you'd only read Mad Magazine, you would in fact kind of know everything about the 1970s and 1980s, uh, even if you hadn't actually experienced the rest of it yourself. I think I've never seen anything with from Adult Swim unless it was when Will Ferrell's baby would would like knock on people's doors and start cussing at them. <laughs> I think have that was seen, college. Wait, humor. have you not seen too many cooks? I don't know. Oh man, we, have you, you not just, seen fill in the blank? The answer is yes. Uh, that's just Matt that's, Welch. I take, saw Princess Bride know, for the first time this weekend. Grab a drink, what? take a gummy, just, just and Google to, uh, too many cooks. Yeah. What just like and give yourself fifteen minutes to, to absolutely pin, like to put a pin in it. Uh, what Adult Swim and it, it's broader than a, it's also the Cartoon Network and even Nickelodeon. But what happened was a bunch of people who came of age during a low point in kind of uh, animated TV shows, in particular in the 70s. And this is partly related to a, an FCC ruling that kids' shows on Saturday mornings had to be educational, and they became unbelievably shitty and pedantic. Uh, and this is why you have the, you know, the, the Laugh Olympics, which was to the you know was to comedy what the Munich games were to uh, you know reconciliation in Germany uh, and a host of other things like the Super Friends which are just unbelievably god awful people who came of age watching that stuff were able to create the the shows that they wanted to watch they gave them to their kids uh, and it's uh, it's a beautiful world of intertextuality and uh, uh, kind of dark humor that is nonetheless up as uplifting and radiant as the blood of the baboon heart. Brack, uh, the character from Space Ghost, is absolutely my personal hero, and anyone who knows the Brack like uh, mo will 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 hear that in this podcast. All I know is that uh, whatever I learned in science, I learned from uh, Electro Woman and Dyna Girl. Uh, speaking of which, Catherine, what did you consume? I also watched a cartoon. I think that's what we were talking about here. Honestly, I blacked out a little, but um, yeah, a lot, really. I uh, went to a movie theater and watched Inside Out 2, uh, the sequel to a Pixar blockbuster about that takes place inside the mind of a young girl with different characters representing her various emotions. And it was Inside Out 1, absolutely fantastic. Inside Out 2, also very, 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 very good. Um, I have two thoughts. One is um, one of the lessons of the movie is actually very, I think, in line with sort of free range, like parenting teachings in that um, things go wrong when you try to protect your children from everything that is bad in the world. Um, basically, uh, part of the plot hinges around burying all memories of embarrassment or sadness or shame in ways that create a incomplete person. Um, and I think that that is something that um, a lot of like Lenore Skenazy's work and even Jonathan Haidt's work in its, in its best form um, really get to. Uh, so probably a good thing for people to hear that in this era when we are increasingly looking to, for instance, put warning labels on social media so the children won't be sad. Uh, my other takeaway from this movie is if you enjoy the dynamic on this podcast, um, frankly, like the dynamic of uh, the life inside of this girl's brain as she hits puberty uh, will be familiar to you. I'm not saying which of you is which character, but uh, on my good days, I'm joy. And on my bad days, I'm anxiety. And that's all I'll say about that. Wait, no, no. You have to. You now have to tell us <laughs> which of us is which of the emotions. I mean. You got to do this live on the show I'm, for everyone. I'm this is... absolutely not going to do that. But uh, if people. You have to publish this afterwards then. Donate to Reason.com or become Reason Plus members and then send me an email maybe I will maybe I will send my picks to you how about that a little incentive between webathons pay to play pay I to play that's, mm. uh, come that's to a live show fun. and ask me next time uh, we have one 
Uh, so speaking of uh, middle-aged men and their emotions, uh, I noticed on, I believe, Friday <laughs> that uh, the band R.E.M., um, uh. was inducted into the I just I songwriters. I, I was like I had a I had a clock uh, or I had a, a stopwatch over here. How long can we get to a Nick Gillespie scoff? And it was one point five seconds. Um, uh, they're inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Um, and uh, beforehand, there was actually a really great uh, CBS News interview with all four of the members they've been broken up uh for 13 14 years something like that and it was the first time that the four of them had sat down um and it was a very moving um thing for this middle-aged gen xer um rem was a very important band to me although you can go entire seasons without listening to anything from them and like uh you kind of wonder what the, all the hype was about they then played at the awards show. They played Losing My Religion, which was their monster hit from 91. Uh, and uh, you can see clips of it. Again, very moving. So I went down a big rabbit hole on REM. And the thing that I'm going to recommend to people is a uh, an interview released a couple of days ago by the great uh, video podcaster Rick Beato. Um, B E A T O, like Greg, um, uh, who uh, is always like breaking down uh, popular music, songs, whatever, and he plays every instrument. He's a very uh, skilled musician and an explainer of things, but he also interviews people. And he interviewed Mike Mills, the bass player, uh, also does a lot of piano and backup singer, uh, backup singing for REM. Um, and it's just a great interview. It's like uh, uh, 80 minutes long, um, filled with all kinds of, of fodder, of uh, things to think about way beyond and different from music. It's very kind of generation appropriate. He keeps going back to like the, uh, you know, the, the the importance that they had from the beginning of uh, since they understood about musical history of owning all of their masters, having total creative control over everything at every stop um, and how their uh, sort of shared vision of four kind of odd people who fit together was not necessarily this is what we want to do, but this is what we don't want to do. Um, and that sort of eventually uh, kind of ended up kind of creating an anti-vision that became a vision. Really super interesting about like organizing yourself uh, artistically and fitting them into the context and ethos of the 80s and then the 90s that they blew up. Great, uh, interesting commentary about uh, Kurt Cobain, um, who had a relationship with the lead singer Michael Stipe, a bunch of other stuff uh, besides. But a really interesting interview, even if you don't really care that much about REM, some of it's super music and text uh, and, and technical and some of it is not. Uh, but Mike Mills is a, is a terrific guy uh, and uh and just a very, very interesting discussion. So check it out. Mike Mills, The Story of R.E.M. is the name of it. We'll put a link in. Yes, Nick. Oh, I was going to say we've also reached the age where they now look like the banana splits, Matt. So it's kind of great <laughs> when you see all four of them together. Um, I would add, uh, you know, Rick Beato is a great listen, whatever he's talking about, particularly when he talks about the business of the music industry. But us, also, uh, Michael Stipe did a great interview with Rick Rubin on his Broken Record podcast, uh, which is also worth checking out. Uh, that came out within the past year or two. Um, so, uh, you know, Matt, we have talked about REM. I used to be a super fan and then kind of cashed out. They are fascinating to listen to, but that might be, uh, you know, because we're old men at this point and they mean something to us in our youth, but um, very, also very true. interesting characters. Jason Isbell, who gave the introduction at the Songwriters Hall of Fame, had two points that I thought were pretty interesting. And I'm not I'm nobody's Jason Isbell fan um, necessarily, although I appreciate his talent. Uh, but he said uh, that nobody really covers their songs, which is true. Um, and interesting, although uh, his and the, which is also true of the Beach Boys, by the way, for kind of similar reasons of of it's a bit complicated to play like that. Um, but also that uh, for his his experience of listening to it is like listening to this as a weird kid in the South made me feel like um, uh, that maybe there was other weird kids in the South uh, like me. Um, and you can extend that writ large. I mean, uh, the weird kids anywhere. And then you wake up and realize that everyone thinks that they're a weird kid. <laughs> and this is the biggest band in the world because of that. Uh, just very interesting. But anyways, uh, enough prattling on about that. Uh, that is our uh, podcast for this week. Uh, Nick, are we in kind of senescence? Are we in the zombie cell mm -hmm. mode when it comes to live events in New York City? Uh, and uh, Or if not, uh, 
disabuse me of that notion? And if so, tell us what you got on the podcast coming up. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff uh, coming up on the podcast, including a wonderful uh, interview with John Mackey of Whole Foods. And we've, uh, I'm going to be talking to Mike Rowe of uh, Dirty Jobs, who has a uh, patriotic movie coming out that's pretty interesting. We've got a lot of stuff on tap there. Uh, events will be uh, posted as we develop them at reason.com slash events. Terrific. Uh, go to all our podcasts at reason.com podcast and make sure when you're going to reason.com slash donate and you're adding a new donation that you put somewhere near the subject line. Catherine, please tell us uh, which emotions uh, Nick Gillespie are, uh, mm. but we all know who it is. It's, it's, the, it's the anger bear. Let's, let's be honest. Uh, there are new emotions in, in Inside Out too. There's more to oh, choose Oh, really? From. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll go watch. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll catch you next week and goodbye.